Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, robot, loin streamer, and today it is why. The day about you guys and your stories and learning more about the way that you guys write. I mean, really, we are getting a peek into your guys' twisted minds. I don't say that lightly. Gimp man. But before we get started, number one, if you enjoy what I do on this channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on this channel, check out the links down in the description. One of them is Lemoy, which is what we're doing here today. It's a monthly prompt that I give you guys. You write a story that fits into the, the, the perimeters of the, the word count, and then the first Monday of the month, we read the stories together. Number two is the Fresh Meat feature. If you have a book out there, you send me the first chapter and the cover page, and I will read them here, and uh, hopefully it'll help more readers find your work. Third thing, if you would like to read any of my books, the links are down in the description below as well, and you can find them at all of your favorite retailers, and uh, ask, ask for them at your libraries, because you can get them there too. Fourth and final thing is... Uh, if you're just looking for a fun way to hang out, why not keep an eye out for the Yakuza streams that are going on over here at the moment? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's the shoes. Oh, there goes my heart. Oh. Oh. Guys, did it just get hot in here? And join us on Friday nights for the loin stream if you're into that. So you're gonna have to come and see what the loin stream is about if you want to know what the loin stream is about because, uh... First rule of loin stream is we don't talk about loin stream. Okay, so with that said, let's jump into the prompts. And this month, I gave you the first line of the story. Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they'd been treated? As usual, everybody featured in this video will be linked down in the description below with any of their social media that they have provided. The first person is Geklo. Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they've been treated? They deserve this. It's given them this. My actions have enhanced this. No. A coyly delivered prompt from a repulsive, rotting man. Is that a comment on me? Okay, it's not that far off. Sir Ornadin of the Brittle Castle, his bewildering fashion of dress was as striking as his pupilless eyes. If not for such fashion, you could tell he was rich from just how well fed he looked. The contrast to the many slaves in his congregation, all skin and bones, made the smugness of his lips infuriating. Mons Carter could barely hold such rage and refused to answer Ornodin's condescension. He felt helpless as he was held in place by his own guards who betrayed him, forced to look the creature in the eyes. Maybe he could die with some remainder of pride. If Renodin had mind to assimilate him into that molding armada of lives, then he'd sooner bite his own tongue. Just over the railing of the fort's balcony was a horribly perfect view of the markets on the bay below the starless sky, upon which the small army brought onto shore had successfully set aflame its entire community. I'm a kind man. I'm wonderful, see? I'm what people need, an opportunity for optimal results. The fires below us are optimal results. My people have been starving for months on the ships, so their pleasures tonight will really feel special in their hearts. The fruits of their patience will taste sweeter than ever. They will all be thankful to me, as they should. I'm a wonderful man. Mons Carter stared back at him with a mix of emotions that a human face could never portray. Adrenaline was in every inch of his body, panic was in every centimeter. He could just bite it now in advance. Maybe it was hopeless, maybe it was better to get it over with now and hope his soul wouldn't have to stick around for any funny ideas or Odin had for his corpse. Maybe it was just confirmation bias that sent Carter's gaze to the sky. All the stars he'd grown up with were gone. He wanted to believe it was an omen when they all vanished weeks ago. That if he had ended things when it started, he wouldn't have to stick around for the darkness it would set upon the world. The silent reasoning in his head spun round and around, until it convinced him. He bit down violently with resolve he'd never known before. The pain was surprisingly duller than he'd thought it would be. He didn't yell or make noise of pain. His last fixation was on the embers from the village rising into the cosmos, Figured they were carrying souls of his friends. Maybe they'd be taken to where the stars went. He decided that he would go with them. And as he was blissful in those last moments, Ornodin's face was disappointed. This feels like we got a prologue going on. The start of something for Mr. Mons Carter over here. Going into the other world or going into something of ghosts so that maybe it would come back. I don't know. But it's got a lot of atmosphere to it and... 
And Mons Carter feels very grounded. I especially liked the sentence about all of the stars he'd grown up with were gone. He wanted to believe it was an omen when they vanished weeks ago. Also, Marnodin has such a presence in him. So very good job of capturing like characters and setting and making it feel like it's there in such a short amount of time. The next story is by Charles Robertson called Six Corvids. My gosh, we're getting into the Corvids. Obviously, I love Corvids. We got this, this man right here who is technically a Corvid, though he doesn't look like it right now. We got this guy right up here with his little raven. We got the raven who actually is a raven up there somewhere. Like, shh, there he is in all of his, his deathly glory. So, uh, you could say you're something of fans here. Also, possibly just trying not to die. There is that, because we know that ravens will literally eat your heart out, as this man shows us right here. Let's see what Robert's got for us. Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they'd been treated? What right does man have to keep such creatures from feasting when it is he who has humbled them, starved them, mutilated them? Perhaps he did such things to keep them from growing, from learning, from taking over man's title as Earth's one true apex predator. Or perhaps his one true desire was a lust, that oh-so-great sensation that is epicaricacy. Generations ago, they came to man's dwelling from the heavens, but six there were. Strange black crow-looking things. A three-foot male that was black in all aspects, along with the male's harem of equal-sized females. Also black, but with red legs and beaks. Man merely observed his new neighbors. In Man merely observed his new neighbors initially, and his angst grew with each subsequent observation. At first, the Corvids were nothing more than a nuisance, picking flesh from the dead they found, defiling corpses of beloved pets and family, and such so that they could not be buried with dignity. Then the Corvids stopped fluttering away when threatened, and grew violent to protect their scavenged meals, so there would only be skeletal remains left to bury. It was only later that man would come to know that Corvids must be eradicated, as they learned to watch and listen, so they knew what voices to mimic, luring out pets and children to be fresh meals for the day. And so crafty and sly were these cosmic birds, they had left many petless and childless before man knew of their hunting. When he did learn of the Corvid's hunting, he came with gun to destroy them, but instead found their nest with many eggs yet to hatch. So man left and came back with a net to capture the Corvid's instead. In his cravings for vengeance, man trapped corvids away and boiled the eggs the juvenile corvids would hatch screaming in agony as the tied-down adults would croak, watching the flesh tear away, bringing forth corpse stew, which he forced them to swallow down before finally removing their sexual organs. The six corvids grew quiet once all their young were within them and mimicked as one, only three in presumably the three different voices they first heard them spoken. Pain. Schadenfreude. Extinction. These words meant nothing to man until, after being left to starve for so many long years, they escaped, and he saw the words played out. First, the Corvids swept man to the ground and humbled him as he had them, corpse stew and all. Then he lay mutilated in agony. They mimicked the sound of the man's laughter, a joy they had taken from his suffering, and then they simply slaughtered the man. Why shouldn't the Corvids help themselves to hunt for man? After he had guaranteed their extinction, is it not fair to in turn gift man the very same outcome? I really like this. Like, I would read a collection of stories of like myths, mystical creatures or stuff like this that sets up the relationship of kind of weird, mystical animals or interpretations uh, in these little blurbs, that would actually be a really cool, I think, anthology idea to get more than one author involved in, to just have all of these different interpretations of how, of mystical idea creatures or animal related creatures. But I really like this. I could see it being done with like illustrations on the sides. The next story is by Daniel Benham. Why shouldn't he help himself after he has been treated? Why shouldn't he help himself after how he's been treated? Said Roxy from the corner of Petra's office. I mean, who knows what happened to him before you found him? Petra shook her head. 
No, it's my fault for using cheap sweatshop components. I should have known that they would glitch out of my conscious AI. I should have known they would have glitched out my conscious AI. You hacked his brain? Of course I did. Petra tried to triangulate the signal again, but something was blocking the transmission. You find a kid at the side of the road, practically dead, and your first thought is to insert a chip into his head? Did it not cross your mind to call an ambulance or take him to the hospital? They smashed his skull and made brain pate with his frontal lobe. Without my bypass, the best he could hope for was a vegetable. And being a programmable robot is better? Roxy shot her a look of disgust. Petra took one last look at the map and closed her laptop. Well, obviously, he's not under my programming anymore, is he? Sarcasm dripped from her voice. Roxy backed away as Petra stood up. Fixing up his body is one thing. I've seen the work that you've done for cybernetics, and I'm all for medicine catching up with science, but the brain? She shook her head and chewed her lip as she followed Petra into the hallway. You must see how messed up that is. Petra slipped into her coat and pulled her keys off the hook. Are you going to help me look for him or stand there and try to lecture me on ethics? It's done, Rox. Roxy's eyes darted around the hallway. Sweat slicked her palms. We had better find him before the authorities do. That's the spirit. They hurried across the car park to Petra's small black car. I'm driving. You're shaking too much and I can't afford my insurance premiums to go up again this year. Roxy nodded and slipped into the passenger seat. She looked over her shoulder into the back seat. How on earth did you get him back to your lab? The boot is deceptively large for a compact car. Petra typed the last known coordinates of her quarry into a sat-nav. Stunned to silence, Roxy focused her eyes straight ahead. Her insides squalled. The tires spun on the rain-slickened tarmac. She grabbed for the seat and sunk her nails into the leather. Breathe, Rox. I don't have the time to do CPR, and I'm all out of components for a replacement heart. The sound that came from Roxy was halfway between a laugh and a cry. She went from holding her breath to hyperventilating. Steady there. It was a joke. Not funny, she stuttered between ragged breaths. Petra lowered the window to allow fresh, cool air into the car. Odd numbers. Remember, odd numbers work better than even when evading a panic attack. You taught me that. Roxy nodded and started slowly counting with each breath. Gradually, her heart slowed and her chest loosened. Thank you. See? I'm not a complete monster. These girls have great chemistry. Also, great job jumping into like an action scene and moving it and giving us enough information, like getting us really into having the information to know what they're doing. And we're getting a lot of character. And I'm ready to keep reading more of this. The next story is by Melissa Farmer. Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they'd been treated? Silver lining. The space is so drafty and cold while I feel my heart race. The sweat rolls down my flustered cheek. My all black clothes plastered to my petite body. I hear her fancy heels and nauseating smell of perfume resonate in the air as she walks past the closet I'm hiding in. Mrs. Jones, what will you be doing with Violet? The female maid asked in concern. Shut up about that piece of filth. I can't have her loving another girl. How absurd. I know I didn't really love her to begin with, but for her to go and be a slut made it even worse. Now leave. My mother's harsh words spat out. I cracked the door open slightly to see her sitting at a huge pine wood desk pouring her normal scotch. Her long blonde hair has finally had the curls fall out, and her shirt instead of tucked into her button-up skirt now wrinkled and hanging out. Her red nails are still razor sharp, ready to slap the shit out of you or scratch you when she thinks that you even breathe the wrong way. Now is the time. Take that blade. Kill her. I blink. I was trying to catch my breath. She is hurting us, my love. Do what she did to us. Kill her. I must do what Kelsey tells me to do. My love, my everything. The only one who ever cared. I slowly approached the drunk mother. Her chair is facing the other way from the closet. I turned the chair around fast and swung for her throat. As my mother gargles on her blood, she spits out, I killed your little friend and you were next. I lost it. All I saw was Scarlet. It's over, Violet. You are okay. It's all going to be okay. The maid found me and calmly stated. 
I'll take you under my wing with your mother's inheritance and we will live a better life freely. Your mother was a very cruel person. She left all of her money to me because she didn't trust no one else to take it. However, no one expected this. Let's get you cleaned up and then we can burn this place to the ground. Through tears and anger, I asked, what about Kelsey? She fucking killed her and she was speaking to me to kill my mother. The maid took a deep breath before speaking again and gently moved my strawberry blonde hair out of my face. Honey, since you were a child, you were able to communicate to the other side and even get a hold of the shadow people, which are very dangerous beings. Your mother wanted nothing to do with that, but I love you and always cared when I could, when she allowed me to. There were times that she would take me from you out of spite because she knew that I had grown an attachment to you. For the other side are ghosts or the dead once they have passed away. The shadow people are kinda like the rulers of that realm, but they hold very dangerous powers that can harm the living. Your mother did kill Kelsey, which is why you were able to hear her. Now let's try and get you to clean up, honey. I tremble. Okay. Later that night, we watch the house burn up in flames as we hold all the riches. I have a new mom willing to teach me how to use my powers and maybe I can see Kelsey again. My love, my everything, a new life to live. I don't know why this was giving me Shirley Jackson vibes, but it was, maybe. It's not like the house was heavily described in any sort of way. We got the, dis the description of a desk, a brief description of like a huge pine wooden desk and then mom sitting in a chair. But I still felt like I could see the house. Also, obviously, I just freaking love ghost stories. Look, if you touch on any of my obsessions or fixations or something like that, ah, uh, you got me. And ghosts, because of body more specifically, you got me. I don't feel like this is necessarily a prologue, though I think if the word count, like my word limit that I put on you guys so that I don't spend five hours reading stories. Um, but I feel like this could be a self-contained story if developed further out from where it is now. But there's a lot of like good going on here that could be contained or could go into something longer like a novella or a novel if you really wanted to. But I feel like this could just with slightly more could be a complete story because it already feels self-contained. The next story is called The Do by Gao Chan. I am waiting for Gipman to just randomly show up in here. <laughs> Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they've been treated? Tapping her long fingers, giving off an... Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they've been treated? Tapping her long fingernails, giving off an ethereal light green glow on a jade tabletop, J.E., the goddess of life and death, asked her two peers sitting around the table, cause and effect and murky the boundaries. Such a thing shall not happen, not within the realms of man, said Ver Shayun, the god of light and darkness, shaking his head. Man shall not overstep, man shall not attempt the realm of the gods. But what has befallen them was clearly beyond what they ought to endure. The evil has left their mark and fingerprints. It's not their burden to bear. Now wreck the god of order and chaos side. Their realm is crumbling, their world is darkened, and will perish before their due. This seat votes in favor of intervention. This seat votes nay, Vershon sat straight. As the divine laws dictate, a tribulation is in order. As the seat that votes in opposition, the laws of light and darkness call forth a tribulation of man. As the seat that raises the motion to intervene, the laws of life and death express no objections to tribulation. After a short moment of silence, J.E. raised her hand. Then it settled. Narek's voice resounded in the room and in all universes. Motion of intervention shall move forward pending the fruits of tribulation. The laws of light and darkness propose the tribulation by dues of gifts and blessing. Vershayon raised his right hand, the jade table around which they sat glow in a gentle white light, and a small droplet of liquid appeared in the air right above the center of the table. If the table deem it suitable, I will proceed. No objections. No objections. As laws of light and darkness will it, this dew of tribulation shall be infused with the blessings of light and darkness. Bring forth the trials for man to seek light in darkness and to understand darkness under the light. Winding threads of black and white appeared in the droplets of liquid floating above the jade table. 
as laws of life and death will it. The dew of tribulation shall be infused with the blessings of life and death, bring forth the trials of man to celebrate life from death, and accept death while blessed with the richness of life. Spinning pots of bright green and dark red appeared in the droplets, as laws of order and chaos will it. This dew of tribulation shall be infused with the blessings of order and chaos, bring forth the trials of man to build order from chaos and to cherish chaos within order. Rings of gold and dark orange appeared in the droplets. When all three gods were done with their blessings, the droplet appeared from where it was. The ripple of space to the time emerging from its former position signified the official beginning of the tribulation, a process and journey to which all three gods would pay close attention. Through space and time, the droplets of dew flew and traveled. When it finally reached a crowded city under a night sky and a bright crescent moon, it floated in the air towards a closed window with a thick curtain behind it. Right after it passed through the window and the curtain, it split in half. A man was asleep on the ground, wearing nothing but his shorts, revealing countless bruises all over his body. Beside him hung a full-body, high-grade latex suit hanging on a coat hanger. One... <laughs> Ekal, did you really? I was starting to feel bad that I made a joke about Gimp Man, and then it's like, this, this god power. I love this so much, Ekal, Chad. <laughs> Beside him hung a full-body, high-grade latex suit hanging on a coat hanger. One well tailored to fit his body and had many zippers on it. On top of the hanger placed a latex full head mask with only three holes, two for the eyes and one for the mouth, and the hole on the mouth was closable by zippers as well. The man woke up not because of the droplet of dew falling on his forehead, but because of the loud inconsiderate laughs and chatter from some couple that went on a late night stroll. It was the first time this week, and though he was a fan of pain and aggression, this was still quite the annoyance. Seemingly sensing his frustration and displeasure, the latex suit glowed in the darkness, and just with his quick thought in his mind, the suit flew over and put itself on the man's body, like an AI-controlled armor in some movie. Wind chimed around him as the man went through the window without even disturbing the curtains and started falling to the street. His landing was quiet almost soundless, even though it was a fall from the fifth floor. The laughing, slightly drunk couple had no idea that they were targeted until the man got close enough to emerge from the bushes under the dim street lights, with his arms outstretched in front of him. Grrr. The man lowered his voice and growled, obviously attempting to be menacing. Holy fuck! The couple were startled and fell onto the ground. The boyfriend tried to stand up and fight, but the moment he laid eyes on the man's glowing pupils, his clenched teeth, his drooling mouth, his latex suit, his vibrating shoulder and arms, and the fierce manner in which he thrust his hips and humped the air, fear and panic filled his mind. All he could do was grab his girl by the hand and run away. The man's eyes followed the couple until they disappeared in the night, somehow slightly disappointed. Ika-chan, you are the best. This is fantastic. Oh my gosh. I want all of the adventures of, uh, of Gimp Man. Like, for real. Gimp Man goes shopping. Gimp Man goes on a blind date. Gimp Man... <laughs> what all could we make him do? What all could... What all could you make him do? That is the question. I feel sorry for anybody that comes after this story because clearly this is going to be the best one of like all of them. I'm sorry. There's no beating this, which means check out his book in the link. The next story is by R.S. Alessi. I'm sorry you have to follow that, R.S. It's just... This is going to be impossible. Even though I do like your boys, Xander and John. Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they'd been treated? In a chair beneath the gavel window overlooking the sleepy main street below, John sipped his coffee. The view was nice, but he was here for other reasons. His fellow lawyers stood clustered around the coffee maker at the opposite end of the room, ignoring him so thoroughly that it seemed they'd forgotten he was there, or maybe they thought he couldn't hear them. It wasn't the smartest thing to do, but can you blame him? 
Once upon a time, the building had been a lovely Victorian mansion. Someone had remodeled it in the style of a bland corporate office, consuming its high ceiling with drop ceilings and fluorescent lights, carpeting its wood floors and painting the walls a shade of industrial gray. The remodelers hadn't managed to eliminate all character, but there was still the slopping mansard roof and the gable windows. And look where that got him. No one had been happy about John's promotion to partner. Unhappiest were the three staff attorneys who considered themselves top contenders for the role before John bypassed them. Former rivals became conspirators, and they dug into his past. You must admit, it is odd. Instead of the hoped-for dirt, what they found was nothing. John possessed a license to drive and practice law in the state of Georgia. That's it. Bending a few company rules, the conspirators came into possession of his social security number and, with their further research, discovered it belonged to a man of the same name who would be 122 years old this August. Fraud, they cried, believing they had the evidence they needed to oust John from his undeserved position. He must have connections. Just as the conspirators began to squabble over John's soon-to-be-vacated post, they were called into their senior partner's office. All of John's documents were in perfect order. They were told and they would be disciplined for illegally billing clients for the hours spent investigating John's past. Do you really think it's a coincidence the way it turned out, given? The legal assistant's voice dropped. Everything else? Everyone assumed the matter was settled. John's name was cleared and the offending parties were punished. Not until later did people comment that the conspirators' plan to visit the local winery the following weekend was odd. They had no reason to celebrate. They didn't even like each other. Carpooling to and from the winery was standard practice. If the driver got pulled over, they always weaseled out of their well-deserved DUI. For that reason, news that the vehicle had been involved in a car crash wasn't surprising. What was surprising, not one of the conspirators was wearing a seatbelt. The funerals were scheduled for next week. The whole office would be shut down. Someone ought to say something. One lawyer had remained silent until that moment. Now he said, I disagree. What? Why? If you truly believe John is responsible for everything that has happened, given, as you say, everything else. Someone ought to say something. One lawyer remained silent until that... One lawyer remained silent until this moment. Now, he said, I disagree. What? Why? If you truly believe John is responsible for everything that has happened, given, as you say, everything else, there's only one correct response. He paused. The others leaned in. Don't fuck with John. Across the room... John smiled into his coffee. I love that he's magical. Look, I barely even finished reading this story. And I'm just like, I just, I love the coincidental and like the all-powerful dude over here and just his regular life. I love the John stories. I was, I was going to say, please don't stop sending them in, but I want to read them as long as you are happy writing them because I love this character and I love the design of his magicalness and like slowly learning about him and seeing more about his life, even though I don't know what kind of magic he is. I just like this mystical, like this casual mysticism, which is something that you often do in the styles that you write, is making the magical mundane. And it's just fun. And just imagine John with like the nicest smile. He just looks like a nice guy. The next story is by Logan Gunn. Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they've been treated? So many times I've tried, never once have I succeeded. I bled for them, they bled for me. No longer friends, only enemies. Yeah, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. Sore throat, ears ringing, sweat, stink, conversation, adrenaline, a headache, whiplash, a crick in the neck. He held his eyes shut tight, mouth agape, his voice and a hundred others, harsh and throaty, gravely from worn-out vocals, bounced off the walls of the dank and dark venue. The din filled the air above a field of spiked, 
pastel-colored hair, a vibrant ostination. She touched his forearm. Her tender hand wrapped itself around his wrist and pulled the raised fist down to his side. When he opened his eyes, he was standing in an empty hall. The house lights went up. A playlist of better, more successful punk rock bands was playing over the PA system. Sellouts, he thought to himself. Show's over, her voice quiet and smooth, undamaged. Their fingers interlocked. She looked up at him. Her eyes asked for a kiss. Well, he cleared his throat. How was your first punk show? She half smiled and shrugged. Good. The punks, the skins, the checkered ska kids and hardcore folks, even your favorite Joe wearing blue jeans and a plain gray or black t-shirt, made their way towards the exit. There's nothing else like it, he said, looking down at her with glee. She was pretty. Prettier than any girl there that night. She was pretty. Prettier than any girl there that night. A girl untainted and uncorrupted by the culture, the music. If anyone here could be called unique or different, it was her. At least for the time being. Did you have a favorite? He asked. Favorite band, I mean. She looked at him quizzically. I'd say the last one. They really got into it. It was raw and fast. I only wish I could have understood what they were saying. That was the beauty of it. It was its own language, indecipherable to those who hadn't spent hours in their bedroom, cross-legged under the watch of a dozen posters, flipping through CDs, booklets, memorizing the lyrics to each and every song on the album. No excuses, no filler. Each had to be learned by heart. He squeezed her hand. You ready to get out of here? Yes, I need fresh air. The air was fresh indeed. Red glowing orbs appeared all around them in the shadows of the eaves of the venue. They pushed through the thick cloud of smoke, American spirit taking on the Marlboro Man in close combat. The two of them wanted nothing to do with that battle. I know a place that we could get a drink. I know a place that we could get a drink, he said. I'd kind of like to walk around a bit. I think I need a break from big crowds. They both chuckled. She said, I've been thinking about that last song. The lyrics there, at the end? I thought it was all gibberish to you. I caught the last little bit. She stopped to look him in the eyes. That line about people helping themselves or whatever? Rather than sing it, he recited the line as if it were spoken a word of poetry. Why shouldn't they help themselves? After the way they've been treated. Why shouldn't they help themselves? After the way they've been treated. That's the one. What about it? I don't know. I guess it just sounds like nonsense. It doesn't make any sense to me. It makes a little sense, he laughed. Out of everything that came from the mouths of those singers tonight, that's what you picked up on? She began walking again, watching her feet as she stepped. Probably some tongue-in-cheek humor, he said. You see that a lot in punk rock. Or maybe it's political. You know, fighting back against the man. I thought we agreed not to talk about politics. Oh, I know, he stammered. I, I wasn't gonna get into anything, just, you know... I'm not on board with all these systematic, oppressive, capitalistic th Why don't I choose the concert next time? No politics. He paused for a moment and thought. Then he asked, What did you have in mind? How about the Dixie Chicks? <laughs> He's go She's gonna get you, bro. She's gonna get you. That was fun, though. I like... There is so much lightheartedness in it that I really like. I like the, the writing style, the pauses. The narrative voice of this is so good. Logan, I really like your style of writing. And just having this lighter moment between these two characters and having giant of a breather. Because I know as much as I love ghosts and I love Corvids and like Ravens and all the creepy spooky things. And like when we're talking about some dark stories. But I also love me some squishy stories and some character chemistry. And these characters got chemistry. This is great, Logan. The last story is by Klina. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's how I'm saying it. <laughs> Why shouldn't they help themselves after the way they'd been treated? Ryson, the peasant, stood dumbfounded when confronted with the sheer enormity of the wealth before him. Piles of gold, each bigger than his parents' farmhouse, glittered in the torchlight. The dunes of coins and treasure stretched across the vast natural cavern, out into the dark beyond the light the company had brought with them. The boisterous dwarf Angmar laughed as he stomped up behind Ryson. A dragon's heart! The elf was right! Look at him, bill him! More gold than I could imagine was in the whole world. I'm Ryson, sir, 
Billum is dead. Uh, he was the one that, you know, with the holes, the grinding blades. I know, sir, he was killed by the, um... Ryson tried to form the words to describe the shadowed terror that had drenched him in his childhood friend's entrails. How the thing had boiled from the shadows and torn Billum into flying a gore with its six arms. How Billum's betrothed would be waiting in the village until Ryson told her the horrible news. How the child growing in her would never know its father. He tried to force even a single word out, but stood mute. Ah, the Shamblin Ulagon. You've got to be on your guard when the likes of them are about. He was a grand torchbearer, not soon to be forgotten. Angmar said with the sincerity of an underpaid actor. Brom called the two surviving torchbearers over to him. He was a massive barbarian who wore nothing but a broad leather belt and an improbably stuffed loincloth. He shoved a pair of burlap sacks into their hands. <laughs> it looks like you're going to earn all ten of your shillings today. Fill up the bags and haul them out to the wagon. We heroes are going to search for the true treasure, the heart of Zur. Bring a shovel and maybe a wheelbarrow on your way back. Ryson and his fellow torchbearer, Tristan, hauled the grain sacks of gold and jewels down to the dark and uneven branches of the cavern. Toward their employer's wagon, the torchlight deepened the shadows cast by the folds of shiny black rock. Tristan, come here, Ryson said as he dropped his bag to the ground. He dug into the sack and grabbed a heavy collar of thick golden links, each one set with precious stones. Hide this in your shirt. I ain't taking that. That isn't mine. They'll kill me for a thief. Tristan waved away the gold collar. Ryson pressed the jewels to Tristan's chest. You'll take this because I'm going to grab something too. We're in this together, and that way we both know that we're not going to say something. Shit, Tristan. We have enough gold back there to buy every farm in every kingdom and still have money left over. We haven't got a full acre between us, and we're bleeding and dying, and we deserve more than ten shillings per day. Ryson dove back into the bag of treasures and pulled out a ruby nearly the size of his bald fist. I'm taking this one, and neither of us is saying anything. He tucked the gem into his pocket and hauled the rest of the treasures to the wagon. The two torchbearers had hauled sixteen loads of gold and dumped them into the bed of the wagon. Its axles creaked with every shovelful of gold coins thrown on top of the tons already piled in. Ryson's muscles ached. Scoop, lift, dump the treasure into the wheelbarrow. Scoop, lift, dump into the wagon. His back, his arms, his shoulders locked him into repetition. Work, haul, work, haul, work, and his heartbeat. There was nothing else in the world but the work, the pain, and the whoosh thump of blood pumping. Brom stopped the torchbearers as they started loading the wheelbarrow with golden coins for the 17th time. <laughs> Let's pick up the pace. I think that we can get a couple more loads into the wagon, and I want to be out of here before the dragon gets back. Agmar lobbed the bejeweled scepter at the barbarian from the throne that he had dug out of the pile of coins. Don't be daft. There hasn't been a dragon in a thousand years, you meat brick. We couldn't get through the cavern too abreast. How's a great big flying lizard going to manage it? You've put muscle where your brain should be. Yes, sir, Ryson said, hanging his head. Whoosh, thump. His heart pounded in his ears. We'll work harder, sir. He couldn't move. He couldn't even flinch as each beat of his heart shot pain through his whole body. Bright red lances streaked through his chest and to his brain and to the very center of his being. Pulsing agony radiated from the gym hidden in his pocket, pressed against his hip. It pulled him down like a chain tied to the center of Earth. Hey, Torchbearer! What are you doing? The massive barbarian was yelling, but his voice was tiny, distant. Ryson could barely see through the pulsing red-black of the pain. The adventurers were little things, a child's toy dropped and forgotten. He is the heart of Zyre. That's ours. We earned it. The adventurers were waving their irrelevant little arms at Ryson. He drew a long, shuddering breath and blew out a thousand long years of pain. The mountains of gold melted into bright, glowing waves that rolled out in front of his sigh. The barbarian was screaming about being the world's only dragon slayer. Ryson scooped him up in an enormous taloned paw and flung him across the cavern. He vanished into the molten gold with an abbreviated splash. Ryson settled his massive, scaled body onto the unmelted pile of coins and stretched his serpentine neck. In a corner by the mouth of the cavern, he found Tristan. He was filthy and streaked with sweat. Leave and never tell anyone. 
Ryson growled. Ooh. 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 You know, I've read a handful. Fantasy is not really my genre. Surprise. <laughs> but this intro stands out to me as so unique and so interesting. And I don't know, I don't know if it's the characters. I don't know if it's the pacing. I don't entirely know what it is. But something about the, and I, it could just be your style. That is like you as an author just really has like some sort of touch where your voice is like boom. But it feels like there's something really special about this piece. And I can't quite put my fingers on it. Finger on it. I feel like saying fingers makes it weird. But anyway, those were all of the submissions for this month. Thank you everybody for submitting. It is a pleasure as always to read you. Again, I feel sorry for anybody that came after Gimp Man because uh, clearly the prophecy man of the century and Egao Chan is freaking amazing. Uh, <laughs> the new challenge should be linked down below if I didn't mess it up because I do have a tendency to miss doing something correctly with that link. But it should be down below if, if you would like to take a look at what the challenge is for October and maybe... Maybe jump in. Maybe, uh... Get in there before Egao Chan because he is going to dominate the competition with Gimp Man. Gimp Man is going to freaking scare everybody else off while he's in his Gimp suit. Just quietly growling. Probably has a ball gag in his mouth. Anyway, thank you so much for joining. I hope you guys enjoyed the story. Let me know what your favorite was down in the comments below. And until next time, have a great week. Don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know, or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it. But as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk. Why? Why? Did you do that? To the left, plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry. Flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right? <laughs>